measure things was invented and being used about the year 1500 B.C. And when I heard that, a alarm went off because that's about the time when the Ten Commandments were given to Moses. How wonderful a, a contrast there is. God was giving people a measuring stick about the time they were beginning to use one to measure things. Isn't that fascinating? And you know, at first the measuring sticks were pretty much inconsistent. They were all kinds of different lengths and they used all kinds of things. You remember the cubit that was used in the ark is considered the length from the elbow to the end of the middle finger. 18 inches, but if you're like some people, it's 22 inches. So that ark could have been any number of different dimensions, really. We don't know what a cubit was, actually. Well, an inch was used the width of a finger. And in some languages, the word inch means finger. Okay? That's where it came from. Well, you, you know then where the foot comes from. Right? But it was in uh, the early, well, 1950s, I guess it was, that they set up a standard for the foot. So that every foot would be equal. <laughs> Because before that time, they really weren't. And so, they used the inch. And the word for inch comes from the Latin, which means one twelfth. Ha. Twelve inches in a foot. Okay? And so, the foot came into existence with a standard measurement that's recognized all over the world ever since then. Okay? Well, you know, we need some kind of measurement we can rely on. We need something that we can believe in and trust that's going to be accurate when it comes to God and when it comes to what God wants us to do. And so tonight I want to share with you my ruler of 12 inches. Okay? And here's the inch marks on the ruler. Number one is the here. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 24, Whosoever heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will liken him unto a man who builds his house on the rock. Hearing. Absolutely necessary. But the word hear implies not only taking information in with the ear, but allowing what we hear to make a difference. If you have your Bibles tonight, I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 13. And I want us to notice what Jesus had to say about hearing. Jesus spoke in parables. And he says that the reason for the parable was so that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not hear. He didn't want everybody to get it. He wanted them to have to dig a little deeper than just hearing words. He wanted people to have to think. And unless God can get people to think, He can't do much for them. But notice what he says in Matthew 13, 13. He says, Therefore speak out of them in parables, because they see and see not, and hear if they hear not. Neither do they understand, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. Now some people hear, but they don't know what they just heard. They hear, but they don't understand it. And partly sometimes it's because they hear it and didn't really have any interest in it. You know, I hear things all the time. We live in a world filled with sounds and noise and TV and radio and all kinds of commercials and noise of all kinds. And we learn to tune them out. I can hear a lot of things and not pay any attention to really what's happening, what's going on. Jesus knew that. And he said, you have to really hear what I'm saying. And he says, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart, notice, and should be converted. If we don't hear the Word of God, there is no conversion. So it all starts with hearing. Hearing intently, hearing carefully, hearing with understanding. But he says to his disciples, but blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear for verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see these things. 
that you have seen, have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. Now I don't want to go completely through the parable of the sower, but I just want to point out this. In the parable of the sower, every time the seed drops on a heart, it's because the person hears the word. Every time. Notice, verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it, then comes Satan and scoops it away. But at least they heard. He that received the seed in stony places, the same as he that hears the word, verse 20. And with joy receives it, and then tribulation comes and zoom. It's lost. Verse 22, two, he that receives seed among the thorns is he that hears the word. And the cares of the world, the seed wants the riches, choke it out. But he that receives seed, verse 23, into the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, which also bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. First inch of this ruler. We must hear. Now James, in James chapter 1, verse 22 says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For he that hears the word and does not do it is like one who beholds his face in a glass or a mirror, and then walks away and forgets what kind of man he saw. And he says, You must do he that doeth is going to be blessed in his deeds. So God knows. We have to hear. But we have to hear right. We have to hear because we want to hear. We have to hear because we want to learn what we want in our lives. And what God wants us to do. But now, Romans the 10th chapter. Hearing runs into the next one. And let me show you how. Romans 10, verse 10. Paul's writing to the Roman Christians and explaining to them how they came to salvation. And he says, With the heart man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made of salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. For the same Lord over all is rich and all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now I want to stop right here. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What does that mean? When Saul of Tarsus was converted, in Acts 22 and verse 16, Ananias came to him and said, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now what does that mean? We hear what the Lord says and we do what? We call on His name. We call on His authority by doing what it is He said. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But now let's go back to our text. Verse 14. But how shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? Think about that for a minute. Can you call on someone, ask somebody for help if you've never heard anything about them? Can you go to a doctor you've never heard of? Can you call some help service on the phone if you don't know anything about them? No, you have to hear first. You have to have their phone number. You have to know about them. And that's why hearing leads to this next thing. And he says, How shall they believe, verse 14, in whom they've not heard? Okay. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And so you've got one enough. Okay. That's the next, next few verses I really like. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, now, allow me this pun tonight, okay? How beautiful are the feet of them that proclaim glad tidings of good things. Feet. Older 
preacher said, and I don't know if you've ever seen my feet, but he said, they ain't beautiful. <laughs> but that's not the point. The point is those who bring the message allow us to hear. I don't know who first brought the truth to you, so you got to hear it. They might have had some of the ugliest feet in the world. But as far as God's concerned, those were beautiful feet. Somebody came because they loved you. Somebody came because they cared. And so, we first of all hear it. But guess what comes through hearing? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Jesus in John 8, verse 24 said, If you believe not that I am He, you will die in your sins. We believe that. Now Jesus was talking concerning the fact that He was the Son of God. He was the Savior of the world. And He said, look, if you don't believe that, then it's over. Okay? The Hebrew writer, Hebrews 11, verse 6, says, without faith it's impossible to please God. Faith is going to have to be on this ruler. You can't get there any other way. And what faith does is shown to us in Hebrews 11 chapter. If you're familiar with Hebrews 11 chapter, it's the chapter of faith. Okay? Abel, by faith, offered an excellent sacrifice. Okay? All the following characters, and we can name many of these people, there was Noah. By faith, he prepared an ark for the saving of his house. There's Enoch who walked with God and pleased God and he was not for God took him. By faith he walked with God. We have Abraham who by faith left his homeland and came to a country he did not know. We have the faith of Moses. Though he was raised under the glories of Egypt, he decided not to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season, but he pulled out and left to help the people of God. By faith, by faith Abraham, when he was asked of God to kill his own son, considered by faith that God could raise him from the dead and was ready to make the final blow. By faith. By faith Sarah conceived when she was beyond the age of childbearing. By faith the walls of Jericho fell because Joshua followed God's law. In every one of those cases, faith did something. You know, faith is the steam that drives the wheel. And we're going to see tonight that in every one of these things, faith from here on out is going to be the foundation that's going to take us from here to heaven. Our faith is absolutely necessary in all that we do. But then Jesus taught that we are also to repent. Now, if we didn't have any sin in our lives, repentance wouldn't mean anything. But because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, we have to repent. In Acts 17 and verse 30, the Apostle Paul at Mars Hill said, the time of this ignorance, God overlooked, but now He commands all men everywhere to repent. The word repent really means just to change, but it's an involved changing. It involves several things. I'd like for you to notice in the Bible, if you have your Bible, Matthew the 12th chapter, verse 41. Jesus is going to explain what it means to repent, and I think He does it better than I could. Verse 41. Jesus said, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, the prayer of Jonah is here. Well, you know what that's going to make us do? We've got to go back and find Jonah. <laughs> okay, so go back, take a little time, and see if you can find the book of Jonah. <laughs> sometimes that takes a little while. Those here, man. There. Go. 
So in the book of Jonah, the prophet Jonah, after much to do, goes and preaches to him. And when he enters the city, he began to call out, verse 4 of chapter 3, and said, Forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh, notice, believed God. There's your faith. Without faith, you can't repent. There's really no reason to repent. If you don't believe what God says about your life and sin, you have no need to repent. They believe the preaching of Jonah. And they believe the message of God. And they took note of what Jonah was saying. They believed God, verse 5, and they proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least. And the king heard about it and he got up and, and he mourned and grieved over the sins of his people and he sat in ashes and he proclaimed and published through Nineveh saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water, but let them mourn for their sins. Now notice verse 10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. And that's repentance. It's a change of mind that results in a change of life. The sad thing is, history records that Nineveh didn't stay turned toward God. Later, Nineveh is going to get destroyed by God because they're going to go back in their evil way. But on this occasion, they turned from their evil to God and they repented. And God said, Fine, you'll not be destroyed. And so repentance is absolutely necessary. When Peter on the day of Pentecost, in Acts 2 and verse 38, told those Jews, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. He was serious. They had to change the way they were living. They had to repent. But the next thing that Jesus thought that we must do is to confess. Now, I don't think you confess anything unless you believe it. And you're probably not going to confess anything unless you've heard about it. Then you can believe it. Then you can confess it. Matthew 10, 32, Jesus said, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before the Father of heaven. And then he added, And whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father in heaven. Now there's a choice for us. We can confess him, or we can deny him. Later, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Verse 12. Notice what the Apostle Paul writes to his young associate. Verse 11, beginning, he said, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we should also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now friends, I don't believe that that's just something you do in order to become a Christian that you can just blow out the window and never have to worry about it again. Confessing Jesus is an absolute necessity through the rest of your life. If you ever deny then Jesus' promise comes true. You deny me, I'll deny you. I don't care how many years you've been faithful as a Christian. I don't care how many good deeds you've done. I don't care what you've got going for you. You deny the Lord, He'll deny you. Absolutely certain. And so to confess Jesus Christ with the mouth is a part of what it takes to go to heaven. Matter of fact, in Romans 10, the Apostle Paul there says, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you can't say it and mean it, you can't go to heaven. 
If you can't say it, if it's not from your heart, you can't go to heaven. And if you are ever brought into a trial and they threaten your life, if you would deny Him and let you go, if you confess Him, you die, you have to die. Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death. You've got to die. You can't deny your Lord. And you know why? Paul explains to Timothy, he says, because Jesus one day made that same confession before Pontius Pilate. You know why they crucified Jesus? Because he said, I'm the king of the Jews. Because right then, the priest rent his garments and said, we have no more need for any explanation. We've heard blasphemy. With his own lips, he said he's the son of God. He's got to die. And may God help us never deny him. He died for us with those words on his lips. So the good confession is absolutely a part of going to heaven. But you know, baptism is mentioned. I don't know, sometimes I think maybe we spend too much time on baptism. Maybe that's because people don't like to get wet. I know it's you wear raincoats tonight. <laughs> I don't know what it is with the world. You know, why do people get all caught up in some of this stuff? It, it really doesn't make any sense. But you know, when Peter in Acts 2.38 said, Repent and be baptized, he didn't just make that up. Mark 16, 16, Jesus had told Peter and the other apostles, you go and preach this. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Why? Just like all the rest, it's because God told us to. And I mentioned the other night, 1 Peter 3, 21, it has to do with our faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. If you really believe He died for your sins, was buried for your sins, and rose to give you a eternal life in heaven, then the least you can do is go through the formality of baptism. Okay? Let me show you a passage that absolutely proves that baptism is absolutely necessary to have our sins forgiven. It's found in Acts 22 and verse 16. I've looked long and hard for any number of verses that would prove this point. And I believe this one does it better than any I can find. It's just plain and simple. Let's take you through the account leading up to this. Saul of Tarsus has left to go to Damascus. He's got letters so he can arrest Christians and persecute them and kill some of them. The Christians hear about that in Damascus. They're scared to death of him. He's done this all over the place. And he's coming to get them. But on the road, a great light shone down around him, blinded him. He fell on his knees. And he cried out, The Lord, Lord. And Jesus said, Why persecutest thou me? And then Jesus tells Saul, Get up and go into the city, but he told him what thou must do, must do, must do, must do. Jesus didn't tell him what to do. And a nice to do that. So Saul goes into the city and he's fasting and he's praying and he's, he's mourning his sins and he's grieving and he's beginning to realize what he's been trying to do to Jesus. And Nice comes in and says, Saul, Brother Saul, he calls him to his kin by genealogy. Brother Saul, why tarryest thou? Now notice this. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Wait a minute. He saw Jesus on the road. He's mourned. He's grieved. He's fasted. He's prayed. Your sins be forgiven you. What sins? The sins he still had. And if baptism wasn't necessary to get rid of those sins, then what in the world was Ananias talking about? And why is it that Paul began to preach baptism? It's in all his letters. It's in all his cases of conversion. Why was he at it? Because baptism is necessary to please God. And that's all I have to, have to know. Now we'll add this. In Acts 19 chapter, Paul runs into some people who've been baptized wrong. 
This is possible. You can be baptized wrong. I've known people who were baptized for the wrong reason. They thought they were already saved, then they were baptized. Or they thought they were baptized just to be added to the church. Okay, in Acts 19, these people were baptized with John's baptism, and they didn't know a thing in the world about Jesus and the promise of the Holy Spirit. And so when Saul asked them some questions, they don't know the answer. We don't even know that there is a Holy Spirit. He says, okay, we've got to get you people baptized. And he taught about Jesus, and he baptized them. Now here's the point. You can't be baptized more than once. But if the first time is no good, you have to be baptized. I had a young lady came to me one time. She said, preacher, she said, I've been, I've been baptized three times. She said, I was baptized in the Pentecostal church. She said, I was baptized again uh, in another denomination. And she said, I've been baptized over and over. I studied the Bible with a little while and I said, you know, did you do it Jesus' way? Did you do it like the Ethiopian in Acts 8? She said, no, probably not. I said, you've never been baptized. That was something else. That was baptism. Because baptism is the name of Jesus. It's got to be done right. It's got to be done right. Well, now you might say, well, we're through, aren't we? We've got to find a salvation. Sometimes we stop at baptism, we think it's over. I think we've made a real mistake here. Folks, this is not over, it's just starting. Baptism is where we begin. Look here. We've got eight more inches to go. Now, where are we going to get down? Well, take your Bible. Second Peter. Bless his heart, Peter tells us what. Second Peter has something for us that has amazed me all my life. And I've always thought, you know, if somebody could just tell me how to get to heaven in a simple fashion, then I could know exactly how to do it and I could get there. Right? Now we've seen that all these things are absolutely necessary for receiving the remission of sin, so they have to, have to do these. But Second Peter chapter 1, he starts off by saying in verse 3, that God, as His divine power, has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Isn't that an awesome thought that we get to be partakers of God's nature? You know, that's why we're baptized. That's why we become Christians. We're wanting to be like God. We're wanting to leave sin behind. We repent, remember? We're wanting to go somewhere where no one has gone before. Divine nature. Having escaped the corruptions that's in the world through lust. And besides this. Now this is an interesting phrase in here. Besides this means putting it alongside. Besides what God has done. His exceeding great promises. His blessings. And, and His offer of His divine nature. All the things that God's provided for us. And besides this, we are to give all diligence to add some things. And diligence carries with it the idea of urgency. We've got to get busy people. We don't just come out of water and baptism and go back to bed. We didn't go through all this and Jesus died on the cross for us just so we could get lazy and, and sit on the pews once a week. Okay? Jesus didn't die on the cross for that. I'm sorry, but he didn't. There's more to it than that. A lot of people who start out as Christians never will see heaven. And it's because they don't pay attention to Peter. Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Now this word add is really interesting. It was the word, if I can explain it right, that was used of somebody who organized a chorus and paid for it. <laughs> and that's strange, I don't know. But we're talking here about an orchestration. We're talking here about a production number. We're talking about putting everything in place and making it sound like God wants it to sound. I'll tell you something else that's fascinating. These next items... There's eight of them. You know how many notes there are in an octave? Eight. And we tune up. 
We tune up. We take the first note and we use that to determine the next note. Don't know if you've ever been in a band, but somebody in the band has to play the first note. And then everybody else has to tune their instruments to that note. Well, guess what the first note is? Faith. Add to your faith. Everything we do is about trusting God. Okay? Now what are we going to do? First is virtue. I think I've spent my whole life trying to figure out what that word means. Virtue. Let me help you a little. Proverbs 31. Okay? Verse 10. Whoso findeth a virtuous woman finds a Finds her a great price. I guess that's the way. Remember that? A virtuous woman. Well, what's a virtuous woman? That's hard to know. Is she kind? Is she compassionate? Is she... What is virtue? Well, I'll be honest with you. I had to go looking this stuff up because, you know, the Bible tells us about virtue. As a matter of fact, here in 2 Peter chapter, chapter 1, notice in verse 3, something we read just a moment ago. According as His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. But virtue is a, is a bit of a strange word. And you know, I had a little bit of a problem trying to figure out exactly what virtue was until I found... Henry Thayer in his Greek lexicon. He wasn't the only one who did this, but I think he did it better than anybody else. You know what virtue really is? Any moral excellence, modesty, purity. You know what this word is about? This word is about 1 Timothy 2 and verse 9. Women, adore yourself in modest apparel. This word is about morals. This word is about thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not curse and use God's name in vain. Thou shalt not abuse thy body. Morals. My friends, the church cannot desert morals and be saved. God won't take anybody to heaven who cannot clean their moral life up. Heaven is a place for pure people. And it's not always easy to clear up all these morals, is it? Look at 1 Corinthians 6. If you will, just for a moment. And you know... The preacher preaches to himself and all he says. We have a lot to think about being Christians. Verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 6. Paul says, Do you not know me? He writes this to Christians. Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, and that's another phrase for homosexuality, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Not here all the time preachers talking about, you know, the church don't have to pay attention to that. That's a sense of the world. No, it ain't. That's a sense right there in Corinth. That's a sense. As a matter of fact, Paul is going to say, and such were some of you. Pretty horrible things in that list. But you've been washed. But you've been set apart or sanctified. But you've been made right in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You need to do better. You need to live for the Lord. You need to be moral. 
It's a sad thing when the morals are as bad inside the church as they are out in the world. 1 Corinthians 5, Paul even deals with the situation. He says the world don't even do the stuff y'all are doing. For a man's having an incestuous relationship with his own mother. He said, well, Gentiles wouldn't even do that. Who are you people? Where'd you get that? Do you believe Jesus was immoral? Some people in the world seem to believe he was. They make movies about it. It's not right. Jesus was without sin. He was pure. So should we be. And so virtue is about morality. We need to keep our morals about it. Add to virtue knowledge. The book of Hosea, chapter 6 and verse 4. Long ago, Hosea said, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. That's Hosea 4 and verse 6. I'm sorry. Got this verse. 1 Peter 2 and verse 2. He says, If you are bathed, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may be able to grow thereby. But you know something? Ever since I became a Christian, I've been reading all these studies they do about Christians and what they know about the Bible. And every one I have ever read, and I guess there's about 20 all in all, when they test the average Christian, and I'm talking about people in the Church of Christ, the Lord's people, over half cannot give the plan of salvation. What? You know what Envy Harvey used to tell his students in Bible class? He said, you should be able to leave this class, and if somebody asks you a Bible question, you should be able to write an answer on the back of a postage stamp and have room to sign your name. We've got a generation of preachers and Sunday school teachers and Christians that don't know diddly. Because they don't listen to Paul. He wrote to a preacher in 2 Timothy 2.15. He said, buddy, you're going to have to give diligence and study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly divided the word of truth. If this thing is the word of truth, we better give it some attention. We better get to Bible class. We better crack a book. We better meditate. We better pray over this thing. If we get it wrong, we're doomed. Most Christians listen to somebody somewhere say something and say, oh, that must be it. You want to trust your salvation to that? I don't study this book as much as I ought to. This book is the only thing standing between me and eternity. In John 12, 48, Jesus said, my words will judge you in the last day. You can't get to heaven without this book. And you can't get to heaven unless you know a little bit about it. And what you know about it better be right. Or you're in trouble. And so am I. Add to morals, Bible study. And the Bible study, self-control. There's a passage in the book of Proverbs that says a man who controls his own spirit is better than a man who takes a city. That's Proverbs 16 and verse 32. Think about that. A man who controls his, himself is more powerful than a man who can take a city. I think sometimes about Paul and how intent he was on controlling himself. But there was a reason for that. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12, I want to share with you a passage that, that meant a lot to me over here. It frightens me a little bit. But here's what Paul said. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but notice, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I'm not taking any drugs that's going to make me lose control. I'm not going to develop any habit that's going to cause me to lose control. Man, he, man told me one time he was trying to quit smoking and he said, I would get in the truck and drive four or five miles to buy a pack of cigarettes and didn't even know what I was doing. No control! There are people who have sins in their lives that they just absolutely can't stop. Paul 
Paul said, I won't have it. If I can't control what I eat, what I say, where I go, and how I act, then something's wrong. Colossians 3.17, the Apostle Paul there says, Whatsoever we do in word or deed, all is to be done in the name of the Lord. The only way that's going to work is if I'm always in charge of myself. Every deed and every act I do is to be done in the name of Jesus. How is that possible? Well, if I don't have control of myself, I can't do it. Can I? If sin is dragging me around, then I can't give my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. I had a preacher one time told this in a, in a sermon I, I took note of it. He said we need to practice doing without some things. You know the Apostle Paul talks about he, he fights and he buffets his body and he keeps it in subjection. We need to show every once in a while that we're in charge of our lives. We need to take something that's dear to us, something we love and something we care about and just ignore it and leave it go. Something you really love, give it away. Just to prove you're in charge. Because if you can't give it away, it rules you. And Jesus will never rule you if things rule. Self-control. Absolutely necessary. You can't get to heaven if you can't control this. You got a habit you can't overcome. Get busy. Whoop it. And then adding temperance to self-control patience. Patience is an interesting word. James talks about the patience of joy in James chapter 5. Patience is hanging in there. The ability to endure. And if you can't take the hard bumps of life, if you can't take disappointment, if you can't take temptation, and if you can't take being persecuted for righteousness sake, then you're probably not going to make it to heaven. Matter of fact, Paul told Timothy, he said, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now, I know we shouldn't go out there looking for it. But when it smacks us right in the head, we need to be wise enough to realize, hey, I must be doing something right. Jesus suffered when he was here. He didn't live in a bed of roses. Everything didn't go his way. And it's not going to go our way either. So we're going to have to what? Endure. Endure. Patience. The ability to hang on. The next word is add to patience godliness. Godliness is pretty much what it looks like. It means being like God. You recall back there in 1 Peter, he used that when he was talking about our lives and what they should be. Godly. But if you will, turn with me to, to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And I'll begin verse 13 of Titus chapter 2. Looking to the blessed hope, looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar or people of his own possession, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. But now let's go back to verse 11 as he's talked there about us giving ourselves to the service of God. He began in verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. 
The phrase godly means that which is like God. Okay? It has to do with our attitude toward God. And most scholars believe that comes down and is shown in our worship and respect for God. One author says it's the practice of the presence of God in our lives. We're to be godly people. We are to be people who live our lives realizing that God is watching everything we do. We should be ready always to pray. Paul says pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 22. We're to be people who are ready to come before the throne of God and seek His help and receive His mercy at any and every time. We're to be people who are going to enjoy worship. As the psalmist long ago said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We too should be delighted to be able to worship God. And so worship is necessary. I don't believe anybody's going to go to heaven and enjoy worship. Because they don't enjoy being godly. They don't enjoy the presence of God in their lives and the thoughts about God as they live each day. And in the godliness, we have brotherly kindness. You know what Jesus thought about this? He said, This commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. This is a special kind of kindness. This is brotherly kindness. It comes from the Greek word phileo, which means to love. A brother. You know, the, the church is the brotherhood. The church is our family of God. And folks, we have to learn to get along. We have to learn to love each other like Jesus loved us. Matter of fact, Jesus taught that if you can't love your brother, how can you love God? You can see your brother, you can't see God. Why can't we get along in church? Why can't we love one another? Romans 12 and verse 10, Paul says, be, uh, be affectionate in your feelings toward one another. This is chapter 12, verse 10. And I actually begin, begin verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation, hypocrisy. And for that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kind and affection one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Actually counting one another worth more than we count ourselves. I don't know how Jesus ever managed to get those 12 apostles to live together without fighting. You know, one of them was a murderer, or at least was trained to kill, uh, because Judas was one who carried a weapon ready to kill Romans at any time. One was a tax collector, hated by most everybody in town. Judas was a thief. I'm sure he wasn't the most popular guy in the group. Peter was somewhat obnoxious. I wonder how the Lord Jesus ever got those guys to stay together. I have loved you. You know, you had to get a bunch of scattered Christians to stay together. I have loved you. Love one another like I have loved you. And let love be without dissimulation. Make it honest and sincere. We're all different. We're all made of different stuff. But you know what? Jesus died on the cross for all of us anyway. That makes us have something in common. 
And as a matter of fact, John even suggests this in 1 John chapter 5, in verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him that begat loves also him that is begotten. If you love the Father, you'll love them kids. <laughs> if you love Jesus, you'll love his children. That's what John said. We're in this thing together. And you're not getting to heaven alone. Nobody is. None of us are. No man lives to himself. No man dies to himself. We can't go making people angry and upset and causing them to leave the Lord and hope that somehow God's going to help us make it ourselves. Not going to happen. We're part of getting one another there. And we have to work on it. And finally, John tells us that God is love. God so loved the world. But you know, Jesus taught us to love our enemies. This goes beyond the brotherhood. This goes out into the world. And, and what happens when we count everybody as being valuable? What's the greatest thing you can do for any human being living today? You can get them to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, live a Christian life, and go straight to heaven if you really love somebody. We have to be evangelistic. We have to care about all souls. We're not going to get there by ourselves. We're going to have to try to take everybody with us. I know they're not all going to go. Not everybody wants to sign up for the trip. But we have to love people. Have to love Jesus. Love us. We love the world. And God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And so we all have to fit in this together. But now look at Galatians 5, verse 6, as we wrap this up. In Jesus Christ, Living the Christian life. Neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision. But notice this. But faith which worketh by love. You get that? All 12 inches. All 12 inches. And you know what's really amazing about all this too? In the book of Zechariah, chapter 6 and verse 12, the prophet Zechariah says, the branch, that is the Messiah, will be the ruler. He is the ruler. He's the one we owe it all to. He's the ruler. Tonight, will you give your allegiance to the ruler? Will you measure up for Jesus? Will you take an inch at a time? Move down the line? Add and supply and grow and harmonize and develop so that one day heaven will be earth. And you know what Peter says in the close of that? He said, if you do these things, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the word of the Lord, And so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And if you do these things, get this, you shall never, never, never fall. I didn't say that. God said. What a wonderful promise that is. We'll do it His way. We will never fall. Never fall. But we've got
got to keep asking this thing. You've got to keep growing tonight. Do you need to render obedience to Jesus Christ? Do you have the faith it takes to move you into this yardstick, this ruler that's headed for heaven? Maybe you've gotten part of the way and you're stuck somewhere in here. Maybe as a Christian, you've, you've developed a few of these characteristics, but you, you've given up and you failed and you said, well, I'm just, I just can't understand and I can't do this. And I don't have the patience I need. I can't control my mouth. I can't get over this uh, addiction or hobby or whatever. Don't do that. God supplied us with everything for godliness that we can make. All we do is play along and make His music harmonize. Tonight, if you need to come to Him, act upon faith in Him as the Son of God, turning from sin and repentance. Maybe you've not been baptized, so you need to confess Him before Him. Be buried with the baptism. And for all of us who have done that, don't go to sleep. Don't give up. Move on. Move on. So you can never fall. As we stand together. When we walk with the Lord in the light. Guilt by association.